All right, so we are live. My name is Jesse Hildebrand, and this is the first of what I'm hoping to be a series of over 100 interviews for Conservation Stories Canada over 2021. The goal is to bring Conservation Stories coast to coast uh, around the entire nation, featuring things about every possible way you can look at conservation and get involved yourself. So I'm really excited to kick it off today, early in January, with Megan Mitchell. So Megan, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate this. It's my pleasure, Jesse. Thank you for inviting me. So tell me a little bit about yourself, and, and you've got this fancy blue coat going on, so I'd love to know a little bit more about where you're working and what you're up to. Absolutely. So I'm one of the very lucky staff scientists at Science North in Sudbury, Ontario, and my job means that I get to basically take care of our animal ambassadors here on the third floor at Science North and develop visitor experiences, programming, uh, and just the general operations of that floor, which is really the best job ever. <laughs> Science North is really, I mean, having worked with science centers across Canada, Science North is far and away the most respected, exciting science center. It's such a community hub, so you guys do really amazing work. Um, for anyone who, who might be watching this later, if you haven't had a chance to check out the Blue Coat Talks from Science North, see some of the stuff they're doing virtually across Canada, it's really incredible, top-notch stuff, so I'd encourage you to do so. Um, Megan, I mean, one of the reasons we're talking here today is your, your favorite thing. So is there something that you love to do above all else that you can share with us today? Absolutely. And so four years ago, I decided to take the leap into trying my hand at beekeeping. Mm. So in Ontario or in Canada, bees that we are beekeeping, so they're honeybees. And so behind me, I actually have an observation hive. And this is a live colony of bees. So these are, they're all alive. It's winter, so they're pretty slow and sluggish. Um, but they are alive. There's a queen in there. There's worker bees in there. They're doing their really great thing. And uh, and so honeybees are really important pollinators. Uh, but there's also an aspect that I think that we should discuss, Jesse, and it's also native bees as well. So I love mm -hmm. beekeeping. I love my honeybees, but native bees are also really important. Yeah, so I've been hearing this more and more. I mean, uh, pollinators and, and bee conservation is becoming a much more topical issue. Uh, most of us have seen the Cheerios ads highlighting bee conservation. And so one of the things that I think is lost in that is, is honeybees or bumblebees versus a lot of native bee species. So if you could explain a little bit about the difference and what we have here in Canada, that would be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. So honeybees are a non-native species. So they're basically like cattle or sheep. They're a domesticated animal. And so they don't live wild out in the world. So you would never come across a wild honeybee colony uh, unless it's a swarm that's been detached from its mother hive for a short period of time, uh, which does happen from time to time, but they don't generally survive out in the wild. Whereas our native species of bee, and there are many, many different kinds, there's over 150 different types. Wow. Uh, and here in Ontario, the more common ones that we'll tend to see are bumblebees, of course, leaf cutter bees, sweat bees, longhorn bees, mason bees. Uh, and these are all native bees. Some of them are colonial, so some of them live in colonies like honeybees do, but some of them are also solitary. And the biggest difference between honeybees and our native bees is the fact that our native bees are more seasonal. So the queen will start a brand new colony if it's a colonial bee okay. in the springtime. And by the end of the year, all of those bees will die except for the new queens. They go off and they overwinter, they hibernate over winter, and then they start a brand new colony in the spring. Whereas our honeybees are actually overwintering inside of their hive with the help of a beekeeper. So that's the biggest difference between the two. Yeah. And so are, are they both at risk? Are like all bees in Canada at risk? Are native species especially at risk? Uh, what's the situation? Absolutely. So often when we hear about, you know, save the bees, which is really, really good and really important, um, we often think about honeybees. And yes, honeybees are definitely at risk, but so are our native bees. And what scientists are sort of finding is that a lot of those things that are affecting one bee is affecting the other. So biggest things are climate change uh, and uh, pesticide use. So all bees are pollinators of some sort. So whether they're specifically pollinating one or two different types of plants or they're pollinating a variety of different plants, uh, they're really, really important. And when honeybees and bumblebees or other types of our native bees are pollinating 
um, crops that have pesticides on them, that can really affect them in equally, just as equally. And then climate change is also a really big factor as well. Um, even right now, my honeybees that are outside, I'm going off and checking on them from time to time because uh, in, in the milder winters, they actually might eat too much of their food storage and I might need to start feeding them a lot sooner than I normally would. Yeah, has being a beekeeper personally been a really, it sounds like it's been a really impactful thing for you. Is this something that you know any Canadian can do? Can you just have bees at, at your house or property or university or science center? Is this something that anyone could do? Um, for the most part, yes. Uh, there are bylaws that do dictate whether or not you can do urban beekeeping, which is like in, a, in city limits or outside the city limits. So if you are interested, no matter where you are in Canada, you have to sort of like look up where those beekeep or where you're allowed to do a beekeeper or be a beekeeper. Um, but we definitely, anyone can do it. It's it's not as hard as you might expect. Uh, and there are beekeeping clubs and uh, mentorship programs all over that you can get involved with to like see what it's all about. Okay, fantastic. Well, so for people that don't wanna go you know, all the way in, they don't wanna look up all the bylaws and do all that, how can people help preserve bees? Is it as simple as planting wildflowers, maybe to encourage native bees to come? Is it something where you can protect habitats from being destroyed? Like what can we do if, if pesticides and climate change are the problem? Uh, those are, are huge issues. Are there things that we can do locally anywhere across Canada? Absolutely, and you basically touched on one of the biggest things is to always um, plant native flowers or as many flowers as you can. I know I uh, recently bought a house, so I have a brand new garden that I'm uh, populating with native plants and because I do want to attract, uh, I want to attract my native pollinators just as much as attracting our non-native pollinators like honeybees. So planting native flowers are important because plants and bees and plants and pollinators have really co-evolved together so some are just really good at pollinating specific plants and they really go to those ones to get their nectar and to get that um the pollen which is what they eat so yeah. it's really really important to when you're considering planting a garden that you're choosing as many uh native plants as possible because that will attract the biggest number of pollinators i also really like to say that in the spring if you can do your best and leave the dandelions. Uh, that is one of the most important food sources for all bees, for our, our native bees, but also our uh, non-native bees like honeybees as well. And that's their first food source coming out of winter. It's really, really important for them. Uh, and I know that they're considered a weed, but really a weed is just a plant that is growing somewhere where you don't want it, but it's perfectly happy growing exactly where it is. Yeah. Well, I, for one, love dandelions. I try and leave as many as possible. I think they're beautiful when they're yellow and when they're white, so why not? Um, the one thing I, I'm sort of, I'm ignorant of is, so I, I go out in my garden, I have some wildflowers. I've done this too, where I've bought some wildflower packets and hopefully that's all legit. And I think there's there's probably ways to find out to make sure that you pick the right flowers and you're doing something like that. But I don't know how to identify these bees. I mean, I can look this up, I could find a field guide, but to me, a big bee that sounds you hear from a long way away as a bumblebee and everything else is a honeybee. So I'm a, a person just going into my garden. Is there a way to really readily tell, oh, this is a native, that's so exciting. What can I look for? So when it comes to identifying bees, um, honeybees are really, um, they're not very furry and they're more of like an orangey brown color. Uh, with our native species of bees, there's tons of variety. Um, the ones that I see the most often are the bumblebees, are sweat bees and leaf cutter bees. And the way that you would sort of tell the difference is a bumblebee is usually one of like a big round, very fuzzy, uh, depending on the type of uh, the time of year, they might be bigger or smaller depending if it's a queen, a worker, or a drone. So there's a little bit of difference in size, but bumblebees tend to be a little bit bigger, rounder, uh, and much more fuzzy. Uh, sweat bees are quite small, very little hair, and they have quite long antennae, but they're quite a bit smaller. You might confuse them for a wasp. And uh, leaf cutter bees are really neat because they don't have pollen baskets on their legs. So they don't carry pollen on their legs. They carry it on their abdomen. So you'll notice like this like yellow sort of fuzzy stuff underneath the bee's belly. That yeah. would be a leaf cutter bee. And uh, there are some really cool apps that exist to help you identify um, uh, bumblebees as well. So here at Science North, we've been working 
with Wildlife Preservation Canada on helping them with their native pollen the native pollinator initiative, uh, which is targeting bumblebee species that are at risk. So one of the ones we have here in Sudbury, and we actually have a pretty decent population of them here in Sudbury, is the yellow banded bumblebee. And so they will actually come to Sudbury uh, once or twice a year to do a bumblebee survey. Cool. And there is an app called Bumblebee Watch that, they have, that they're involved in. And so you can download this app and you basically take a picture of the bee and it helps you identify the bee. You put it in like where time it was, where you found it, if you found it on a flower, and then that gets sent to scientists who then get to uh, like identify that bee with you. So they'll tell you whether it's wrong or right, uh, cool. and that helps them figure out where the bees are. So especially with our species that need, us, need a little bit more help, like our the yellow banded bubble bee, it's really good. Um, data for them and you get to be a citizen science at the same time very very cool i've heard of bumblebee watch that's super neat yeah. people can check that out and i brought it up in a banner on the bottom for anyone who wants to check that out um i naturalist and seeker stuff that we've used too or, or i've used uh, that are really really exciting so if you're a kid and you want to go out and take a picture of a bee and see what it is that app has a great algorithm for identifying species near you so i encourage you guys to check that out um i have a follow-up question so Sweat bees. I've seen sweat bees in other countries, and it was the wildest thing I ever had where 20 bees landed on me, were drinking all my sweat. It's a very odd feeling. You sweat, like it, it sounds goofy. Do the sweat bees in Canada also come and drink your sweat? Yes. I mean, has this happened to you? Like, is this something, like, I've never had this happen to me. I'd love to have that happen. Be so cool. <laughs> it hasn't happened to me, but I, they're usually really chill and very calm. And that's the thing is that uh, we often get a little bit afraid when there's bees around. Um, and I, if you're generally really calm, you're not posing any threat to the bees, you're not swatting them, they usually stay really calm. So I've been able to get some really close up pictures of bees just by watching them do their natural thing. Which I think is one of the coolest things about bees. I mean, so many people are afraid of them. They're afraid of the sting and some people are allergic and rightfully so uh, should, should avoid them. If you're not though, because they're so focused on food, especially bumblebees, you can get very close. Uh, they'll just eat along a, a array of flowers for quite some time and you get some of the best nature photography. So hopefully uh, people watch this and get encouraged to do a little bit of that. Um, Megan, this has been great. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us about bees? I understand you have some props for us that could explain a little bit more, show some things up close, and I'd love to see those as part I of I do, I do. So, um, quick little story in that I actually caught my first swarm of honeybees. So one of my colonies here at Science North swarmed, which basically means that there's so many bees in the colony that they're too crowded. And so the queen, uh, the old queen will wait until the bees raise a new one and just before the new one hatches the old queen leaves the hive with half of the rest a half of the bees in the colony and leaves the new queen with the other half and when that happens they're going off to make a new home for themselves but as I mentioned they don't do so well in our climate so they don't last for very long but I actually caught my first hive this year and so cool. this is well, some of the comb that they actually started building yeah. while they were up in a big giant white pine tree, which was super, super oh, neato. Wow. And we we caught the swarm, we put them in a colony and they're happily outside right now overwintering. So it was really exciting. How um, cool is that? Yeah, it was really neat. And so this is an example of a, what a frame sort of looks like when the bees are living on it. Yeah. This one obviously doesn't have anything in it right now. Um, but at one point it was probably full of brood, which is baby bees. But it's kind of neat where you can actually see how they build that without. Yeah. And right here is, oops, oh. is actually an open queen cell. So this oh. would have from, a, from a, a hive that was building a new queen that was making a new queen. And then the last thing that I wanted to share was an example of uh, of a bee house. And I'm sure most of everyone watching has seen these around. There's all different variations. When you see a bee house that has little holes, this is actually targeting our solitary bees. So the native bees that don't live in colonies. So what the bee will do is it will uh, lay an egg in these tiny holes, like in the tubes, and then feed the larva. Once the larva is done, uh, 
uh, growing and it's starting to pupate into a bee, the bee will cover it either with like wood or wax or other materials and then that bee will emerge as a regular bee and continue on their life cycle. So those are really handy because you're, you're actually giving a home and a space for our native bees. Um, and then the last thing is if you wanted to encourage bumblebees, uh, it's really good at the end of the season, instead of picking up your leaf piles, uh, leave, a, leave a leaf pile in your yard, at the back of your yard, where it's going to be undisturbed because that is prime habitat for hibernating queen bumblebees. How cool. Oh, that, that, mm -hmm. That's fantastic. That's that's cool. So we've covered dandelions and something that people can do is leave them alone with left leaf pile at the back of the garden at the end of the year. Um, the bee houses, is this something you can just affix to your house? Is there a sort of protocol to this? Is there a place you can best put it? Yeah, so usually depending on the kind that you buy, it will give you instructions on the label. Um, but I know I found the best uh, the best is to leave it out for a season because you probably won't have bees finding it in your first season, but leave it outside. Let it get dingy and, 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 and weathered because I think the bees are a little bit more attracted to it then. Um, but this one here, the one that I have here is actually a planter box. So you can plant your native flowers in here and then attract the bees here. So it's a little bit of a dual purpose. <laughs> That is the swankiest bee house of all time. Well, Megan, that is uh, very, very cool. Is there anything else you want to share with us just before we wrap up? Anything that people can do at home? Anything that you'd recommend or that Science North is doing to help protect bee populations? I think that if you have an interest in pollinators, uh, definitely just like go out, learn as much as you possibly can. Obviously, reach out. You're welcome to reach out to us here at Science North. I love talking about bees, as I'm sure <laughs> you've realized. Um, but we, even here at Science North, like I'll often take people into the apiary outside where we have, um, you know, five hives outside. And just, if you have an interest, seek out the people that will share that interest and it will uh, kind of naturally develop from there. And if you decide you want to become a beekeeper, then you have some resources. Well, men, I can't thank you enough for such a really fantastic talk today. I really, really appreciate this. And it was so nice getting to chat and explore so many cool stories and things that people can do from home. Um, really appreciate you taking the time today. And uh, yeah, thank you so, so much. <laughs>